Today, we have a very special guest. We have Coach Courtney in town. I have something special I want to share with you. When you got started in 2020, I was your biggest cheerleader of getting you on the team. I was dead set on you and was rooting for you in every single meeting. Now, gosh, almost three years later, my decision was the best one. I mean, it's it's evident. I knew two things about you. Your ability to connect with others was excellent. Your ability to communicate was excellent. Those were things that we couldn't necessarily teach. I could teach you all the the coaching things and work with you alongside clients and those different factors. But those two things are what make you a great coach as well as your ability within the intellectual side and your desire to learn. But your communication skills and your ability to connect are top tier. And so that's something that I wanted to share with you today because I've never shared that with you. It lends us well into today's episode where we're talking about you and your coaching and practices that you use within your clientele. So welcome to the show. (laughs) Quite the introduction. It is. No, I appreciate you saying that. And I tell this story to anyone who asks, but I say second to getting engaged to my husband, uh, now husband, the call where you offered me the position to work for you was 100% the most excited I had ever been. Like I was just elated because it was a bit of a surprise and you knew my interest in coaching. You had worked with me for at that point going on almost two years and I was so honored and so excited and not even knowing exactly what I was stepping into but feeling right about taking the step and fast forward and now I've completely changed my career and feel grateful every day to do this work. Like I cry happy tears all the the time, like working with clients, reading their responses, the impact this work can have is what I experienced firsthand from working with you. It was life changing for me in more ways than one continues to be. And to have the opportunity to do that for work is something that I don't take lightly. So I can't thank you enough for being my fan. And just like that, we're a month into the diet. At the end of every month in your diet, it's a really great opportunity for you to take a look and compare photos. That's exactly what we're going to do today. But first, let's take a look inside the diet. When we look at this past week, this is one where my coach, Adam Miller, had increased my food and then also changed my training stimulus a little bit. The reason for this is that my hunger was extremely high and I was feeling very fatigued. And so we wanted to change the training to allow for me to recover a little bit better as well as get more food in place. Now you will see from the tracker here that I was supposed to hit 290 carbs. And I'll be honest with you, I was a little soft in getting my food up there. And I think that this is common for individuals as they're dieting. The reason being is that they're seeing great progress. Their whole goal is to see that scale come down. I was a little timid to increase that food. Even with my knowledge, I found myself in a situation where I was a little scared to go to that higher intake because I was so happy with the progress that I was seeing, even though my biofeedback was telling me that I needed time to rest. So even someone who's as educated as myself has helped thousands of individuals reach their dream body. I still struggle with these small details. I know better. I know that I should listen to my coach and so should you to have those protocols in place. That's what they're there to do. Let them do their job. Looking at last week for Sue, this was the first week in which we decreased her calories. We took another 10% away from her total intake, and it was a very productive week for us. We did not see the trends on the scale that we had anticipated to see with the drop, but we did see physique photo improvements, and we'll be able to see that when we put the photos side by side. Looking at the data week to week is a very valuable tool, but a more valuable tool is going to be looking at month to month and seeing the improvements within the weight that was lost, the improvements in your biofeedback, as well as the physique photos. Sue started with a 10% deficit from what we believe to be her maintenance calories. That deficit started at 150 pro, 
225 carb, and 60 grams of fat. Sue ran into some obstacles, as you guys are aware, because you've been watching every video in this series. She had her menstrual cycle, as well as she got a stomach bug. And so this is an opportunity for us to step back and reevaluate. We did not see the drop in the scale as we intended when we started the diet. If you're only using the scale to track your progress, this would lead you to increasing the deficit, adding more cardio in, and getting more aggressive with all of your protocols. In reality, this is actually going to be worse for your body. It's going to be adding more stress in a situation where the stomach bug, menstrual cycle, were already going to be a greater stress on the body. It's a time for you to stay consistent within the protocols, get another week of fresh data, and then make adjustments. That's exactly what we did. After reviewing that week of data, we got more aggressive within the deficit and increased it by 10%. When we're looking at making changes or increasing the deficit, it's important to have at least 14 to 21 days of 80% or more adherence, maybe even 90% or more of adherence before you make adjustments. If you're not getting to that marker, reassess and understand why you're not having that level of adherence. When we look at Sue's scale readings, we're going to want to utilize the high and low values more than the averages. Now, this is not my common approach when looking at the data collection of scale readings, but because of the variables that we talked about within the stomach bug and menstrual cycle, the averages are going to be a little skewed because of the inflammatory response, the illness, and so on and so forth. So we want to use the high and low readings here with a goal of utilizing the averages more in month two. Sue's starting scale weight was 137.6, and she had a low weigh-in of 133.8. When it comes to myself, my initial macronutrients were 210 protein, 240 carb, and 67 grams of fat. If you go back to the first video, we talked about how this was a conservative deficit for me. And I think that I sandbagged this a little bit because when I went to track my initial nutrition to start the diet, I was a little bit more conservative with how much I was snacking. I was definitely eating more calories than what I led myself and Adam to believe that he was making a 10% deficit from that 2,700 calories I thought I was eating, when in reality, it was probably about a 20% deficit off of what I was eating, which led to a greater rate of overall fat loss, and it was a little bit more aggressive than what we initially wanted, which led to the high hunger signaling and high fatigue that I was experiencing this past week. And it led to Adam giving me that bump in nutrition, which got us to our first adjustment within my intake being at 210 protein, 290 carb, and 67 grams of fat. I was at that intake for a week, and now I'm at 210 grams of protein, 230 carb, and 63 grams of fat. So we got a little bit more aggressive with the diet, and we're gonna be getting after it this next month. Over the first month, my weight had a high of 221.6 pounds and a low of 215 pounds. I had an average of 1.45 pounds of fat loss each week. Now, the average is going to have greater value when looking at my scale readings comparatively to Sue's because I did not have the life factors that she did. Your weight and calorie intake is just two pieces to a very big puzzle in you losing the body fat that you want to lose. I would argue that biofeedback is an even bigger puzzle piece than both your scale readings and your caloric intake for your overall fat loss. The quality and quantity of your sleep your stress mitigation, your digestion, your overall daily activity, as well as your water intake are going to play such a large role. The one that has the greatest emphasis for Sue and I is going to be our sleep. This is the first thing that falls oftentimes when we have a lot of things going on, we put ourselves second and find ourselves only getting five, maybe six hours of sleep and not great quality at that. In this first month, Sue saw improvements in her sleep going from six hours to about seven and a half hours consistently. And I saw an increase from 6.1 to 7.5 on average. This was huge for us, as well as huge for our overall ability to see the improvements in these physique photos that we're about to dive into. I have three side-by-sides made for both of us to review and show you all details that I see from our initial photos to our current current photos and the changes and improvements that we've made. We'll start with my physique photos. 
I want to reiterate this, that we're going to see a little bit more drastic changes when we look at the photos because of the quantity of fat loss that I'm going to have and have had thus far relative to Sue over the duration of the diet. There are a handful of things that jump out at me when looking at these photos side by side. The first thing is that my shoulder width has gotten more narrow. And this is one of the most challenging things for men to experience in their dieting phase. Their clothes are fitting a little bit looser. They're not filling out the sleeves as easily. And they're feeling as though that they're shrinking and losing their muscle tissue. If you're concerned with losing muscle tissue during your dieting phase, there are three things that you need to keep in mind. Maintain a high protein intake. Make sure that you're continuing to get stronger within your training sessions through your logbook. Number three is not getting into too drastic of a deficit to where you're constantly sore and never recovering from your training or cardio. I also notice that a majority of my fat loss is stemming from my extremities. You'll see that my arms have come down as well as my legs, and I've honestly been very happy with the shape that my legs are taking, especially in these photos where in some pairs of shorts, I'm like, man, my legs are getting tiny, bro. But for the most part, when I've got maybe some Lulu shorts that are meant to be a little bit tighter, they look nice. So I've been happy with the progress that I've seen in my legs. I think we can all agree that when we start a dieting phase, we would like to see the fat come off of our stomach first and foremost. More often than not, you're going to see fat pulled off of your arms and legs first. That's because your body is much more about survival than what you want to look like. And it is going to protect your main organs with that fat and keep things insulated and warm and cozy and take that body fat from your legs and arms first. Let's take a look at my beautiful wife's first month of progress. The things that stick out to me is that she's going to have more detail pulled out through her upper abdomen, as well as we're seeing more detail be pulled out of her legs. When we're assessing progress, the front facing photo is one of the more challenging to see progress in in just four or eight week increments. The side profile is probably going to be the one that you can see the most drastic changes early on. I'm not sure on the exact reason why that is. Maybe it's that we're seeing more of your body from an anterior and posterior perspective where we have more opportunities to see overall fat loss, but this has been a commonality amongst my clients throughout the years of my work. What I see within my photos is that I pulled body fat off of my lower back and through my overall midsection. And then I also see glycogen loss and fat loss through my legs. If you remember from one of the first episodes, I talked about looking like a melted candle. And this is going to be part of the puzzle as I still have body fat to lose even when the muscle glycogen or the stores of carbohydrates are deflated, I still have that layer of body fat that we need to work on for me to really see the detail in my physique. This is another discouraging moment for men and women as they venture through their fat loss. Because I believe that when individuals start, they think that as soon as that scale goes down, they're immediately going to see greater definition through their arms and through their legs and through their midsection. When in reality, that definition is going to come, but it's going to come over a greater duration of time and consistency. It's not going to come after week one or week four. It may have to come after week 12 or 14, depending on how much body fat is needing to be lost. And you may reference one of your favorite Instagram influencers and say, well, they they started their diet two weeks ago and they're already seeing greater definition in their body. And I want to really reiterate to you that when you're looking at Instagram or any social media platform that you're getting a snapshot of what that individual is doing within their life. They may have gotten a pump at the gym right before that photo and gotten in the perfect lighting and took a hundred photos to get that one photo that you are comparing yourself to where you have the memory of what you look like all 24 hours of the day. And that's not a fair comparison for yourself, nor is it even necessary to do. So stay in your lane, especially when you're in a dieting phase, stick to your data and trust in the process. When I look at Sue's side by side here, this is going to be the photo that has the most drastic changes for her in month one. We're going to see a couple of changes where her glutes have come down. You see body fat being pulled off there. You see body fat being pulled off of her legs. Her midsection has tightened up, as well as seeing a little bit of greater definition through her upper back. This is one thing that I notice amongst my clients who don't have as much body fat to lose 
lose when we start a dieting phase, that their body does a little bit better of a job balancing the body fat that it's pulling from and doesn't necessarily bias one particular area. For my ladies, this may be something that you experience through your dieting phase that you feel as though that you've lost the glute tissue that you've worked so hard for. Around the glutes and around the hips is a common place for the female body to store body fat. This is another situation where you have not lost muscle tissue. It's simply that the muscle glycogen that was stored is now depleted, and now that body fat that your body is working on and you desire to lose is being pulled off. Although I'm being very objective with Sue and I's photos here, that does not make Sue and I immune to having bad body image days, catching a bad angle in the mirror as we walk by and tearing ourselves down because we feel like we're not making the most progress. Having the knowledge around your training and your nutrition and overall fat loss does not make you immune to having more challenging days. It just makes you more aware. And that's what we're doing within this series is working to make you more aware throughout your fat loss to ensure that you have lasting results. One month down into the dieting phase, two months left. And I know that when we say two months, it may feel like that's a long way away, but it's gonna be here sooner than we know. When you're going through a dieting phase, you have to make the most of every single day. It is much shorter than what your mind conceives. 90 days is a very short period of time to be overly adherent to achieve the goals that you have. The craziest results are ahead of us, and I could not be more excited to experience them. At this point in the diet, have your expectations been met? My realistic expectations or my unrealistic ones? Because by starting a diet after a year off of dieting, hitting my metrics, getting my sleep back online, I should be shredded by now. But alas, I am not. So really taking a look at what my goals were within starting this to have 0.5 pounds of weight loss per week on average, I'm about on par. I will say the scale has been playing with my head more than it has in like probably two or three years, just because I've had some changes within my cycle and the pictures that were shown were taken a little bit earlier in the week and towards the end of the week, my cycle started again. And so I had some shifts up and I got really emotional about the scale and I had to talk to myself about just not letting that take me over and knowing that you were gonna let me know if something needed to change based on those scale numbers. My expectations were in alignment as I was able to have the average weight loss right on that higher end of 1.46 pounds per week for me, but I had expectations that I would look different with that much weight loss. I thought I would look, I'm not saying I don't look good as I've lost the body fat, but I thought that I would look better having lost the body fat than I do. And so it is just reiterating to myself that I need to trust the process. I'll get to the point that I thought I was going to be at, but it's just gonna take a little bit longer than I initially thought. So you're telling me someone who knows exactly what is supposed to happen within the human body, knows how to read the data, looks at everything, can still sometimes get in their own head about what their progress is? You see, I looked at the knowledge and the experience as more of a superpower. And I thought that it would make my results go two to three times faster. And <laughs> that has not happened. So I'm just kind of waiting for the superpower to kick in. But at this point, it hasn't yet. Headed into the second third of this diet, what are your expectations for month two? In month one, I capitalized on the excitement and momentum of just starting the diet. And I know I won't have that going into month two. And so I'm going to have to have greater resilience and discipline as we navigate through the next four weeks. And my hope is that I'm able to stay on that higher end of average weight loss per week. I agree with you. That beginning fire is so helpful and I take full advantage of it. And I honestly think this middle third could be the hardest part of the diet because as you get to the end of that last third, you're seeing visual changes more consistently. Maybe you're hitting more lows more consistently and it can be very exciting. You're getting so close to your end goal, but now it can kind of seem far away. It can seem, why should I get my steps today? One day's not gonna matter. And so really using that drive of of I've committed to something and I want to accomplish what I committed is what keeps me going.
Headed into month two, my expectations are just a little bit of a smoother ride. I'm hoping that that is the case. I feel more locked in of the fact I am dieting because towards the beginning, because my food wasn't low, then I was able to not fully be in that mindset of I'm dieting. And now as it's going on, I've kind of locked in, I've recognized what I'm gonna do, and I'm just excited to see what happens. Over this past week, did you deal with any adversity around your diet or your training at all? I would say we both had adversity of a really, really, really late night paired with a very, very early morning. Alex actually had four competitors this past weekend and they were all over the world in different time zones. And we ended up getting only two or three hours of sleep that night. That is correct. I had an athlete in South Korea, for those that didn't know, I didn't know until uh, peak week myself, honestly, is that uh, in South Korea, relative to Eastern Standard Time, they are 16 hours ahead, I believe. So 5 a.m. for her was 4 p.m. on Friday for us. And so she didn't finish the show until about 2 a.m. here. And then we had competitors here in the States who I had to be up with at 5 a.m. So it was a trip. It was, a, it was an experience. And I think that this is very valuable for us to teach on how to approach your nutrition and training after a night of very lackluster or non-existent sleep. Because we work with a lot of first-time moms and nurses and very busy professionals that run into the same issue. And I think that there are some very, very useful tools that we provide them that we can share with you guys. I think one of the most important things is setting the correct expectation. If you only got two or three hours of sleep and you normally get eight hours, that is a fourth of the amount of sleep that you are getting and probably a lot worse quality because it was so interrupted and the circumstances that you had. So for myself, I didn't try to think that I was gonna be able to train. I allowed myself to just focus on getting outside movement and keeping a little bit more of a low key day. It's not possible for everyone in this situation. But for me, I did get some errands done, but I didn't chalk my schedule full because I knew what the circumstance was going to be. I also was very intentional when it came to food of choosing foods that were going to sit well with my digestion and just make me feel good, which are mostly whole foods. After a poor night of sleep, you often end up craving a lot of junk food or fast food or really sugary food. And Alex even ran into this. I think that next morning you were talking about all that you were craving was having some sugar. This is true. This is, this is true. This is true. <laughs> My taste buds turn into a repellent of those delicious whole foods that I normally eat. And all I crave is pizza, sugary candy, and ice cream. And so I have to really flex my discipline muscle when it comes to having really poor sleep. I wish I could sleep like them. We ain't hating on pizza or any of those super delicious foods, but in this instance, they're not gonna give you energy and they're not gonna provide satiation. But within talking about energy, I believe caffeine is a big one that we wanna touch on too. I feel like it's a natural reaction after a poor night of sleep to run to Starbucks and get the tallest cold brew that you can purchase to try and wake yourself up. And once that energy exhausts itself off of that first coffee, you're going for your second at two or three o'clock. And that coffee at two or three o'clock is gonna hinder your next night of sleep. And I think we can all agree that that second night of sleep where you can't fall asleep after a really crappy night is the worst, is the worst. Oh, I hate that feeling. Never do that to yourself. You probably don't want to hear to not reach for that caffeine, not reach for that pizza, go get movement, all of these other really non-sexy foundational things. But it's exactly why we created this dieting series. We have helped thousands and thousands of people get incredible results within dieting and it comes from these foundational aspects. There's not a magic pill, there's not a quick fix. It's being able to be consistent, be patient, and get the work done. And that's exactly what we're gonna do in month two. We'll see you there. Ooh.